Hello, my name is Wim van Passen. It's a real pleasure to be able to talk for the International League Against Epilepsy, um, Young Epilepsy section on the importance of multimodal imaging in epilepsy. We have different structural and functional imaging uh, techniques. For the structure we use in the first place MRI, but CT can be indicated all as well. And we have several functional imaging uh, techniques with different spatial and temporal resolution and different uh, invasivity. And it's impo important to realize these features. EG, for instance, has a very good temporal resolution but rather poor spatial resolution. PET and SPECT, on the other hand, have a rather poor temporal resolution and a better spatial resolution and are to some degree invasive because you have to inject a tracer. In 3D multimodal imaging, the idea is to register all imaging modalities. You can uh, register MRI with the epileptic lesion, fMRI with eloquent cortex, DTI with the tracts, MAG, ESI, epileptic source imaging, e.g. fMRI, um, then the PET and the SPECT data. And the idea is that the combination of structure and function within one image will improve the non-invasive pre-surgical evaluation. Multimodal imaging is important in the delineation of the epileptogenic zone. It is the region of the cerebral cortex which generates seizures, the removal or disconnection of which is required to render the patient seizure-free. Currently, there is no gold standard multimodal image to delineate the epileptogenic zone. And that is why we combine different techniques. Um, and when all this, the techniques um, point towards the same region, we are more certain that we know where the epileptogenic zone is. This is from Luders and Rosanoff's work, where they describe the different zones. Um, the ictosymptomatogenic zone is where the seizure starts when we take a history or when we look at video EEG. The epileptic lesion is uh, visible on the uh, MR and sometimes on CT scan. The irritative zone is the region of cerebral cortex that generates the interictal spikes, which we pick up on EEG and MAG, which we can use for the co-registration. Ictal-onset zone is where the seizures start. Um, Obviously, we have ictal EEG, but for imaging-wise, we often use SPECT and SISCOM for co-registration. And then the functional deficit zone is the uh, region of cerebral cortex which, in between seizures, uh, functions in an abnormal way. And we often use FDG-PET to look for regions for hypometabolism. These regions help to pinpoint the epileptogenic zone. And once that is clear, the next question is, where is the eloquent cortex? Where are the brain regions which are important for certain functions, such as motor function, language, vision, and memory functions? And again, we have several imaging techniques that help us pinpoint the eloquent cortex in the first place, fMRI and DTI. You have to co-register your images. I will not dwell on the technical aspects of this. You will need software to view the multimodal images. MRI Grow is a useful software which is freely available. We use our in-house software which is called NeuroViewer. A recurrent theme in my talk is to use only optimized imaging data. This is nicely illustrated by the article of von Utzen and colleagues, who reviewed MR data of patients who were, who were referred for pre-surgical evaluation, and they did this review on three occasions. Firstly, they looked at the reports of the MRI of the referring center and in almost 80% of cases the MR was read as normal. Second, 
they gave the same MRI to their local radiologist and in addition they told them the epilepsy syndrome. This is a type of mental co-registration. An epileptic lesion now was reported in 40%, so 60% of scans were still read as normal. And thirdly, an epilepsy uh, protocol MRI was obtained in the same patients and clinical information was provided to the expert neuroradiologist and they found epileptic lesions in 90% around um, and around 10% of scans remained normal. Al Maravasti and colleagues um, of the group of John Duncan evaluated all meta-analyses meta of epilepsy surgery with CG Freedom as the primary outcome to identify features that were consistently prognostic. These are the imaging prognostic features of CG Freedom, freedom after epilepsy surgery. Hip the presence of hippocampal sclerosis, an abnormal lesion on MRI, Syscom abnormality, focal, interictal or ictal or invasive EEG, EEG MRI concordance and complete excision of the uh, lesion on MRI. As you can see, only two multimodal um, features were present, Syscom and EEG MRI concordance. This means that we have to do much more research to identify additional multimodal imaging features which predict a good prognosis. Lambrick and colleagues studied more than 9,000 patients who underwent epilepsy surgery and analyzed the association between histopathology and seizure outcome after epilepsy surgery. Hippocampal sclerosis was the most common pathology, followed by low-grade epilepsy-associated neuroepithelial tumors, focal cortical dysplasia type 2, normal pathology, vascular malformation, FCD type 1 and mild MCD and glial scars. In green you see the group with the good outcomes, in red less good outcomes. Obviously, this is a retrospective study after epilepsy surgery. And the big question is how can we identify the pathology preoperatively? In my further talk, I will describe 12 patients to illustrate the different aspects of the use of multimodal imaging. I will present four patients with hippocampal sclerosis on MRI. Um, and illustrate that multimodal imaging was able to reveal features that were important for the uh, post-op outcome. I will present one patient from the low-grade epilepsy associated neuroepithelial tumors and seven patients with focal cortical dysplasia, no pathology or other pathology, several of whom belonged initially to the MR negative group. In several of these, multimodal imaging was crucial to come to a correct diagnosis and management. These are the different phases in the pre-surgical evaluation. On the slide you see the phases in our center, but obviously this will differ from center to center according to availability of imaging modalities. So in the phase one we get a 3 Tesla MRI with structural imaging, fMRI and tractography on all patients long-term video EG monitoring and ictal spect which we are able to obtain in around 80% of patients and an intrictal FDG PET. In a later phase we might obtain 7 Tesla MRI and MAG and in selected patients we do invasive EEG studies. For Syscom we obtain an intrictal on the left and an ictal SPECT scan, these two images are subtracted and co-registered with MRI. Um, this is a syscom without thresholding and the regions in yellow present brain regions with ictal hyperperfusion, increased perfusion and in blue regions with hypoperfusion, decreased perfusion. It is usual to apply a threshold to show the brain regions with the highest ictal hyperperfusion in this example 
a threshold of two standard deviations was used. Timing of ictal spect injection is crucial. You should know time of injection, the duration of the injected seizure, seizure type and ictal EEG findings at the time of injection. I will not mention this further in the different uh, case vignettes. The conventional way to analyze FDG PET images is a visual analysis, side by side. Another method is stereotactic, stereotactic surface projection on the left and a statistical analysis of the surface projection of an individual patient uh, with the control group on the right. In blue are the regions with significant hypometabolism as compared to the control group. We also use the anatomy-based maximum a posteriori reconstruction, AMAP for short. Detection of hypometabolic brain regions can be difficult and some remain undiscovered using visual assessment. The main reason for this detection problem is the relatively small thickness of grey matter compared to the spatial resolution of PET, known as the partial volume effect. We have developed this AMAT algorithm, algorithm which corrects um, for this effect during the reconstruction using segmented uh, magnetic uh, resonance imaging. The AMAP reconstruction algorithm improved visual detection of epileptic focal cortical dysplasia on brain FDG PET images, of which you see one example. So here is a dysplastic lesion. This is the normal reconstructed PET image and the AMAP where it is more obvious that this is region is abnormal. PET is commonly used to highlight brain regions with abnormal metabolism. But when the FDG uptake is compared between hemispheres on visual analysis, confusion can arise because it might be difficult to determine whether an observed asymmetry is physiologic and due to normal, normal anatomical variation or pathological. We described and routinely use a new method which calculates an anatomy corrected asymmetry index, ACHI for short, to highlight interhemispheric metabolic asymmetry in FDG images without the influence of anatomical asymmetry. Using per anatomical information from MRI, the Akai method only takes into account voxels that belong to a certain uh, anatomical class. So when I present the PET images, I can use the usual PET data the AMAP PET and the Akai PET. In the following case pre presentation, I will use the International League Against Epilepsy classification of outcome with respect to seizures following epilepsy surgery. This classification reports the patient's outcome class and frequency of postoperative seizure days on an annual basis at each anniversary date after the surgery. The classification of a patient may change therefore over successive years. So a class 1A means seizure free since surgery. A class 1 is completely seizure free over the last year. Class 2 only auras. Class 3 1 to 3 seizure days per year class 4, 4 seizures per day, per year, sorry, and to up to 50% reduction of baseline seizure days. Class 5 is unchanged and class 6 is worse. I will now present 12 cases of patients who underwent epilepsy surgery. The focus will be on multimodal imaging. I will summarize data of the ictal symptomatogenic zone, irritative zone and ictal onset zone as measured with scalp EG in the presentation of the clinical vignette. I will therefore not show any video EEG clips. Let's start with uh, patients with hippocampal sclerosis. 
The first case was a man of 18 years old. It was not known whether he, he had uh, febrile convulsions. The epilepsy started at the age of four. He had left temporal epilepsy. An MRI showed left hippocampal sclerosis with atrophy and an increased T2 signal on a, on a flare image. Here you see the uh, PET images, the usual uh, PET, and on visual analysis it is clear that the left temporal lobe is hypermetabolic. But this is actually nicely um, demonstrated using the archive PET data. And it's also obvious that the hypermetabolism extends up to the, the left frontal lobe, which is actually quite common. Um, it's well known that the hypometabolic zone tends to be larger than the epileptogenic zone. This is his syscom with a hyperperfusion in the left temporal lobe. You also see a hyperperfusion cluster extratemporal, which probably uh, represents propagated activity. Here we co-registered the syscom with the Akai. And in the next figure, of um, the intersection between the two is shown. So these are the voxels with hyperperfusion and hypermetabolism on Akai. And this is in blue the, an outline of the resection site. And you see that this region nicely falls within the resected site. He underwent a left anterior temporalobectomy with amygdalohippocampectomy. Pathology confirmed the presence of hippocampal sclerosis and seizure outcome at year 10 was still 1A and he was able to discontinue all anti-seizure medication. Our second patient was 24 years old. Epilepsy started at the age of uh, one and a half years after he got a vaccination. MRI showed an atrophic right hippocampus with a slightly increased T2 signal consistent with hippocampal sclerosis. He failed 10 anti-seizure medicines and had VNS and he had possibly right temporal lobe epilepsy but it was clear from his EG studies that there was extensive uh, propagation patterns. When we look at this PET, you see a completely different um, image as compared to our first case. So there is an extensive hypometabolism on the right, but it really extends to the occipital lobes, uh, also the frontal lobe, parietal lobe, but the largest asymmetry is actually in the occipital lobes. Syscom, thresholded at 1.5 standard deviations, showed several large hyperperfusion clusters. The largest cluster was actually in the left occipital region. The second largest was in the insula on the right, and the third was in the right temporal lobe. From these images, you cannot decide where the ictal onset zone was. The only thing you know is that at the time of the ictal spect injection, ictal activity was already widespread. What we also knew from the ictal EGs and uh, is also consistent with the PET images. Finally, we decided to go to an invasive EG study guided by the multimodal imaging. We placed five depth electrodes amygdala right, um, hippocampus right and left, ventral temporal on the right, orbital frontal right, and subdual grids covering temporal parietal junction on the right and left and right lateral occipital uh, temporal lobe. We recorded 33 seizures which started in all in the right hippocampus. We performed the right anterior temporal lobectomy with amygdalohippocampectomy. The pathology confirmed the presence of hippocampal sclerosis 
and his seizure outcome at year two was a class four, meaning 80 to 90 percent seizure reduction and his seizures were less severe. He was actually quite pleased with the uh, results obtained. The third case is a 44 year old man with onset of epilepsy at the age of 12. He had no history of febrile convulsions. MRI showed a right hippocampal sclerosis and he had right temporal lobe epilepsy although there were some red flags. He had frequent and fast secondary generalization of his seizures which tend to be unusual with mesial temporal lobe epilepsy with hippocampal sclerosis and he also had gustatory hallucinations which tend to point towards the insula involvement His FDG PET showed some evidence of hypometabolism in the uh, right temporal lobe. This is his syscom, and actually this is partly in the temporal lobe, but certainly overlapping the insula. And our reasoning at the time was that it was propagated activity. Um, the images which I show now were actually obtained years after the operation and what we did here is look for the intersection between Syscom and Akai PET and the only region which is highlighted is this bit of the insula. He underwent the right temporal lobectomy with amygdalohippocampectomy and outcome after year 1 and 2 was class 5 so no improvement. Then Breviact was added and he became seizure free for two years. Breviact was tapered, he had the recurrent seizure, but then he was restarted and remained seizure free. So with hindsight, this is probably an insular epilepsy with hippocampal sclerosis, which probably was a secondary um, injury due to the epilepsy. And this is called the insular trap. Um, and I refer to the paper, paper by Philippe Rivrain, avoiding falling into the depths of the insula trap. With the uh, imaging that we have now, we might have avoided this outcome. Case 4 is a 27-year-old woman with dual pathology. She had a congenital right hemiparesis due to a left medial cerebral uh, artery infarction and had left temporal lobe uh, epilepsy. And MR showed a um, left hippocampal sclerosis. It is uh, barely visible in this image. It's much clearer the large MCA infarct and PET data showed hypometabolism confined to the hippocampal sclerosis region and also orbitofrontal on the left. This is her syscom. Um, nicely overlapping the hippocampal sclerosis. We decided that she was a good surgical candidate and planned to only remove the temporal lobe and hippocampus. But due to concerns that this could cause uh, bleeding over here due to traction after the resection, we offered her radio surgery and after two years, the, this is a scan after one year, and the effect was there after two years. So, outcome after one year was class four, and then she became seizure free. This was described by Bruneo and colleagues that the temporal lobectomy in congenital parenchephaly associated with hippocampal sclerosis is certainly possible by just removing the uh, temporal lobe. Then I have one case with a low-grade epilepsy associated neuroepithelial tumor. This was a young man of 17 years old. His epilepsy started at the age of 5. He had right temporal lobe epilepsy. An MRI showed a lesion which the radiologist thought was a layout or FCD. His syscom showed hyperperfusion confined to that region. The PET showed actually a 
fairly extensive hypometabolic area covering uh, the uh, right temporal lobe. He underwent a right anterior temporolobectomy with amygdalo hippocampectomy. Pathology confirmed the presence of a ganglioglioma, WHO grade 1 and hippocampal sclerosis and his outcome after two years was a class 1A. Let's move on to the focal cortical dysplasias and MR negative cases. In focal cortical dysplasia you have FCD1, 2A, 2B. They all have abnormal cortical lamination. The 2A in addition has dysmorphic cells and the 2B dysmorphic cells and a balloon cells. These are all FCD 2B on pathology, 2A on pathology and 1. And some of them are clearly visible. Some are barely visible and others are really difficult to see and visualize. And in these cases, multimodal imaging really has an important role to play. We make use of the morphometric analysis of Hans Jürgen Hüppertz. His methodology is based on the measurement of certain features which characterize FCD such as a blurry transition between grey and white matter and displayed in the junction image. Um, then it is possible that the grey matter extends more than usual into the white matter and this is picked up on the extension image and an abnormal in thickness is picked up in the thickness image. The measurements of one patient are compared with the control database and expressed as Z images. Um, so standard deviation images and why it means the standard deviation is a very high, it's very abnormal compared with the control database. Now what we do is uh, co-register these Z images um, with MRI and you can threshold them. I'll give you an example. So this is a patient with a dysplastic lesion. These are the uh, morphometric features. The extension is in blue the abnormal junction in green, so all threshold at four standard deviations, and the red uh, means the abnormal thickness. Usually you find the green at the bottom of the sulcus and also highlighting the transmental sign. The pink is the probability uh, FCD map, um, and which is obtained um, these maps are a new feature obtained by an artificial neural network classifier for robust automated detection of the FCDs based on these morphometric maps. So when you are um, confronted with an MR negative refractory focal epilepsy, it may be that there is no lesion, that maybe there is a genetic cause that there is a small focal cortical dysplasia and you have to rely on, for instance, morphometry or 7 Tesla MRI or there may be other small lesions. In the first case I will present a man with a very obvious dysplastic lesion. He was 37 years old. Epilepsy started at the age of 1. He had a mild right hemiparesis and he had a left frontal lobe epilepsy with motor seizures affecting the leg more than the arm. This is uh, his probability map and you actually see the dysplastic lesion nicely with the transmantle sign on the 3D flare. This is his pet and I showed you this these images uh, earlier in the talk. So this plastic lesion you see a hypometabolism which is easier to view on the AMA PET and clearly visible on the Akai PET images. We obtained three ictal specs and you see there are different propagating uh, patterns and when you um, 
look at the what is common in these so at the intersection of the three specs it really overlaps with the dysplastic lesion these are the uh, morphometric features the question here really was um, it's obvious that this was nearby or within eloquent cortex these are the cortical spinal tracts so it's really lying nearby the lesion this is the motor fmri i showed you the other side but it is clear that motor functions are within the dysplastic uh, lesion after lots of discussions we went on to a resection of the left central dysplastic lesion with neuronavigation intraoperative ECOG and motor mapping pathology confirmed an FCD type 2b he had a transient right hemiparesis but a persistent drop foot but he was able to walk with an, um, a brace seizure outcome at year 2 was 1a and all anti-seizure medication was discontinued case 7 um, was a 34 year old man age of onset of epilepsy was 12 years he had a right parietal epilepsy um, this uh, his operation was more than 20 years around 20 years ago and this is a scan from that time which was initially read as negative we didn't have 3d flare at the time no morphometry and with hindsight we found this dysplastic lesion in the right parietal area I have um, used the modern tools we have now and the morphometry nicely picked up the dysplastic lesion with an abnormal junction extension and thickness this is the probability FCD map he had an ictal spect and here what we do the junction image in my view is probably the most sensitive of the features we combine structure with function so an abnormal structure combined with syscom uh, and this is the intersection and this nicely highlights the dysplastic lesion he had a resection of uh, this lesion it was an FCD 2B seizure outcome at 10 years was 1A case 7 is a 17 uh, year old woman her epilepsy started at the age of 4 and she had a right neocortical temporal lobe epilepsy with auditory hallucinations and her MRI was read as negative Akai showed a hypometabolic region in the uh, right temporal lobe this is the syscom and it's barely visible we added the junction image and here you have the intersection between junction and um, syscom and on this view it's barely visible so i enlarge it so this was the syscom and this is the intersection at the bottom of the sulcus and then uh, this is probably the transmantal sign so it can get really subtle and then we go back as you have to do for a visual reassessment of the MRI that is the image I showed you earlier on and actually you see a very faint transmantal sign going to the uh, occipital the, um, the, the, the ventricle um, so this represented a dysplastic lesion she had a neurosurgical resection FCD type 2B seizure outcome at one year was class 1A next case is a man of 26 year old his epilepsy started at the age of 22 he had a, uh, a left temporal lobe epilepsy and MR was negative syscom showed hyperperfusion in the left temporal lobe and the akai pet showed hypometabolism confined to the neocortex 
he ha also had a junction abnormality uh, actually several of them and you see when you select the intersection um, it is just confined to the temporal lobe he had a resection which is outlined in a blue hippocampus was spared and pathology was an FCD uh, type 1 his seizure outcome at 10 years was 1A and anti-seizure medi medicines were discontinued so this case belongs to the MR negative SPECT PET positive temporal lobe epilepsy which has been described and um, the most common pathology in these cases is FCD type 1 and it's important to highlight that the new imaging techniques are able to pinpoint these type of lesions I have one case to illustrate a MAG magnetoencephalography and ma magnetic source imaging MSI in Belgium we have one MAG scanner and it is reimbursed um, for uh, indications as described in up to date so for patients with no lesions visible on MRI with uh, kystic lesions focal cortical dysplasia cavernous angiomas and tumors and MR lesions of undetermined significance including those with dual pathology or multifocal pathology or when previous uh, surgery has failed case 9 is a man of uh, 28 years old his epilepsy started at the age of 22 years and he had a right temporal lobe epilepsy interestingly there were no spikes on his uh, EEG and Emma was negative his FDG PET showed some hypometabolism but actually not that striking then we obtained the MEG scan um, because we were also not able to obtain a syscom in this patient but the MEG was very useful and showed these dipoles in the right temporal lobe this made us more confident and we looked more carefully and found this uh, very small right temporal lobe and cephalocell he had a right temporal lobectomy including encephalocell with sparing of the hippocampus and seizure outcome at one year was a 1a let's move on to depth EG studies with electrodes and how 3d multimodal imaging can help in the placement of these electrodes Noah and colleagues from the National Hospital in London describe that you have first an overall strategy followed by a detailed planning of implantation and they compared their strategy and planning before and after disclosure of 3d multimodal imaging and how this affected these so there was a change in strategy in 15 of 44 individuals and a change in planning in a majority 81 percent of 43 individuals and in the 25 patients who underwent stereo EEG there was a change uh, in electrode placement in all of them so they could conclude that 3d multimodal imaging may makes a substantial change in clinical decision this decision making our case one, uh, 10 is a 23 year old man with nocturnal hypermotor frontal lobe seizures with normal MRI we obtained three ictal specs with hyperperfusion in the right temporal lobe it was no evidence of propagation uh, fr uh, from temporal to frontal lobe so it is possible that you have somebody with temporal lobe epilepsy but often you pick up hyper hyperperfusion also in the frontal lobe also ictal pet showed hypermetabolism in the right temporal lobe I don't have an image uh, of this patient spet scan to investigate this further we did a stereo EEG study with four electrodes right amygdala and inferior insula basotemporal right and two orbital frontal medial electrodes and as you can see you can co-register 
these uh, electrodes which you scan on a CT and you co-register your CT with the MRI and you can easily visualize the electrodes. Electrode placement was guided by the imaging. And now the interesting bit was uh, at that time we didn't have morphometry. And after we did the invasive EG study, we obtained the morphometry and applied it to the scans. Um, this is the only EG I will show you in my talk. There was a very active spike focus at electrode position C6. And you can count these. This is the sixth electrode position. This is the morphometry, the junction image, co registered with the syscom. And here you see in green the intersection between syscom and um, junction image and this more or less coincided with the position of the electrode where we uh, registered this very uh, active uh, interictal and ictal focus. So it shows the strength of these uh, um, non-invasive multimodal imaging techniques. We went back to the uh, scans and saw a very faint transmantle sign which we had missed up till that point. S he underwent a right anterior temporal obectomy with am amygdalectomy and sparing of the hippocampus. Again, FCD type 2b, seizure outcome at 8 years was 1a without anti seizure medication. Case 11 is a woman of 42 years old. She had epilepsy which started at the age of 6 years and she had a left, not right, left occipital lobe epilepsy and MR was negative. Syscom showed a hyperperfusion cluster confined to the left occipital and temporal lobes. So again, from these images, it's not clear where exactly it starts. Uh, which bit is the propagated activity. Initially, one of our, uh, one of our neuroradiologists thought there was a dysplastic lesion somewhere in this uh, lateral occipital region, uh, which was not the case, and this del delayed the whole uh, further procedure until we got the new PET analysis techniques. And the PET, which was initially read as normal, the archive showed a very extensive hypermetabolism uh, in the left occipital lobe. Um, and you see here more than seven, uh, 60, it's threshold at 64% difference. So these regions were more than 70-80% less metabolic as compared to the uh, contralateral side. We also did a morphometry and there were junction abnormalities in that region. And here the combination of morphometry junction and syscom gives this um, spot. Then we went with the images back to the neurosurgeon and he thought that there was an uh, FCD in the left lingual gajaris. And when you compare it with this side, it is obvious that this is abnormal. So, we uh, placed four depth electrodes guided by the 3D multimodal imaging. And we placed one electrode aimed at the visible dysplastic lesion, one in the temporal lobe because of the propagated activity uh, on SPECT, and then two more posteriorly, uh, one aimed at this junction abnormality and um, the other aimed at the top of the the yellow is actually the intersection between syscom and akai pet we recorded 37 seizures and a majority at the b1 b2 position 
but we also recorded five sieges from D1 to three electrodes and two from the C1 and 2. We also did a electrical stimulation of the different electrodes but were a only able to induce her habitual seizures by stimulating the B1 and 3 electrodes. We performed an eco-guided resection of the FCD left mesio-occipital temporal. Pathology was an FCD type 2A and seizure outcome at year 4 was 6, um, she, uh, 5. She was certainly was not improved. Then it is important to reassess what you've done. And again, multimodal imaging is a very important tool to do this. Um, so we obtained a post-op MRI and co-registered this with the pre-op and the electrodes placed. So we recorded the most of the seizure at B1, B2, and this region probably is removed. Then we looked at the C1 and 2 region. This is uh, probably also uh, re resected, but the D1 and 3 region is clearly not resected. So it is possible that um, the epileptogenic zone, as we planned to remove, was not completely removed, and we are now proceeding uh, to reassess her case. I remind you of the definition of the epileptogenic zone, which is the region of cerebral cortex which generates seizures, the removal or disconnection of which is required to render the patient seizure free. The important question is why don't we delineate for every surgical case the epileptogenic zone so that the surgeon knows exactly what we think is the epileptogenic zone, what has to be removed, and we could then use this after surgery to see whether we were correct. I have one case, my final case, which illustrates this nicely. So case 12 was a man of 39 years old. His epilepsy started at the age of 15 years and he had a left temporal lobe epilepsy, but MR was negative. When we looked at his imaging, um, you see the junction image showed several regions of junction abnormality. The largest were in the left temporal lobe. And again, this is post-operative. Um, the FCD probability map showed a lesion in the left temporal lobe. Again, you have to go back and look at the MR images to a thorough visual analysis. Uh, the image is a bit dark, but you can see that the parahippocampal gyrus on the left was thickened and the transition with the white matter was blurred, and this was probably a focal dysplastic lesion. The PET showed some hypometabolism, but wasn't very convincing. The CISCOM showed hyperperfusion in the left temporal lobe, and overlapped with the junction abnormalities. And when you looked at the intersection between junction and uh, CISCOM, it's the region more or less of the uh, structure abnormality. His memory functions were not optimal. And he, in fact, did not want formal epilepsy surgery. And, and certainly, he didn't want his memory functions to deteriorate. And he asked if radio surgery was an option. I discussed this with our uh, radio surgeons, and then they asked me, "Yes, what do we have to irradiate?" So exactly, what is the epileptogenic zone? So this was an interesting exercise. And in yellow, I outlined what I thought was the epileptogenic zone. In purple is are the brain structures which have to be preserved, namely the hippocampus. Um, also the eye and the optic nerve. And then they um, outlined the radiosurgical plan, as you can see on the uh, right-hand side. On top, you see the baseline MRI, and at the bottom, the MRI 20 months after radi radiosurgery. And you see that they can actually very accurately um, target the brain tissue that was outlined. 
at 10 years post radiation, he had an outcome class two, which means only auras. So he had very one to two very brief auras a month, and he was very pleased with that result. And he had no additional memory complaints. In conclusion, 3D multimodal imaging is important in the pre-surgical evaluation of patients with refractory focal epilepsy. Use and optimize the imaging modalities available in your centers and it will lead to an improved delineation of the epileptogenic zone and an improved delineation of the eloquent cortex. And finally, I believe that further studies will be necessary to determine 3D multimodal imaging pro prognostic features of seizure freedom in epilepsy surgery. These are my acknowledgements. Um, all the collaborat collaborators which I want to thank. Um, and if you have any further questions, you can contact me on the email address which you see over there at the right the bottom of the slide.